time in the camp has been so different compared to the month I spent here during the summer. The resilience, strength and spirit of kindness is still there. Oh. It's still there, but with a heavy sense of hopelessness. I spent time in the warehouse packing backpacks with plastic bags and ponchos so that people will have some protection from the rain and spent time in the medical caravans helping out my sister. We met mostly young men, quite a few underage boys and a few older guys. Some of the young guys were still acting jokey with us, trying their arm at flirting, being generally normal young men, but behind the bravado, the fear and uncertainty was obvious. They have traveled so far and many have been there for so long living in absolutely horrific conditions. And all that time, we're hanging on to some distant hope that the unknown future would be better. That they would reach the UK and see family and friends again after they had aged the years in just a few months. Now with the demolition and new uncertainty looms, that is all the more hopeless. I sincerely hope people will reach safety and be granted asylum with this forced move, but my heart is breaking knowing that so many will undoubtedly be deported. Once they're separated, separated into smaller groups and dispersed around the country, it will be much easier for the government to swiftly deport them. Many don't speak English or French and will not be able to demand fair treatment and will not know their rights. I'd like to believe that the process they go through will be fair and adequate, adequate and well organized with enough translators and access to independent legal support, but that seems highly unlikely given the actions of the EU up until this point. With the camping cleared so soon, we decided to try to give out all the useful stuff that was left in the caravans and wouldn't be used otherwise. There's a deep sense of despair, but at least we had some laughs too. After their consultations, we weighed the guys down with random assortment of things from the caravan. They definitely thought we were a bit daft handing over face moisturizer and blemish cream, which are not priorities right now. But they accepted them earnestly and gratefully with a laugh. All the faces I saw etched into my mind, men coming in with coughs and colds and sore toes from damp shoes and shoulder pains acting up from where they were beaten by the police in Libya, and itchy skin from the scabies that will not go away because they can't wash their blankets and clothes, which they have to share anyway. Soft, sweet young boys forced to become men with sore throats and stuffy noses taking care of themselves so far from their families living in the muck and filth. It sends shivers down my spine to think of the journeys they've taken what they saw along the way, the treatment they received from smugglers and militias, the brothers or mothers or friends or strangers they saw drowned and swept away in the sea. How will they ever be okay? How are they being treated like this? We weighed them down with vitamins and painkillers and vapor rub and warm socks and packs of tissues and gloves and a wish of good luck on their way out. I never could have imagined that this would be the world I would be living in. Growing up so safe and protected, I assumed the world and Ireland was governed by fairness and concern for others. And when I first fully began to learn of the injustice that is the reality for the majority of the world's inhabitants every day and the multiple oppressions our society is built on, I assumed everyone would be deeply scandalized and care and act. And it still shocks me every single day that this is actually the world we live in, which we have inherited and maintain by choosing whether to act or ignore these injustices. It felt terrible sending all these boys back out into the intensely cruel fear and uncertainty and the coming violence of the riot police, armed and dangerous, with only socks and vitamins to help them along. We had no way to reassure them about anything because the reality of what they're facing is so terrifying and because they probably won't be okay under these policies because the people deciding their fate and implementing the policies of the EU will not have to look into their faces and see each of their individual personalities and histories and traumas and dreams. They will be put on a plane and sent back to danger. I'm constantly shocked by how well people deal with all of this. I put myself in their place and know that there's no way I would have made it this far. And I have so much respect for what they've managed to overcome and still maintain their humanity, still act kind, still smile and laugh, though they're crumbling inside. We finished off the trip by visiting a friend and his sister in their caravan. Despite, despite the stress, they were still as hospitable and welcoming as always. They're from Afghanistan and they really have no clue what they're going to do, trying to reach family and safety in the UK with two gorgeous little children. They've been living in the jungle for 10 months, dealing with a level of such intense and overwhelming stress and degrading conditions that no human should ever have to endure. What's most obvious when talking to people going through this is the total lack of control over their own lives, the humiliating limbo that is waiting and waiting and waiting 
with no indication of what is going to happen and no one to talk to who can give you a real answer for what's going to happen to you and your family. The conditions of uncertainty are corrosive and detrimental to people's well-being and mental health. Those we spoke to and met over the past few days were either despairing, angry or resigned, knowing they have no control over their futures. And underneath all of that is massive levels of depression. The tension in the camp was palpable and no outlets for stress are possible. Uh, I left the camp with a heavy heart and sit in college writing this, confused by how calm and si by the calm and silence around me, knowing that right now so many people are facing terrifying uncertainty as they step onto a bus, taking them God knows where and hoping they'll reach somewhere better. I hope this turns out better than we're all imagining and that the French government treats people in a humane manner. As we left, I took a last glimpse at the camp and wondered how all of this will be remembered, how and who is doing the recording, what will we say we did when we look back on it? How will our governments employ selective remembering to paint themselves in the most positive light possible? So many have gone through this place and been affected by it. There's been so much beauty and so much horror, so much pain. And I wonder what versions of the story all the media are telling. They've mobbed the camp right now to document its fall, which will hopefully ensure somewhat better behavior from the riot police, whose violent actions are finally being recorded for all the world to see. But the cameras will be gone soon and people will be hidden away in centers. This is not just a news story or something that should be forgotten in a week, though the eviction and demolition is an attempt to erase the presence and reality of, a, of the camp and make it into an invisible history. The story continues for all those facing state violence, unrelenting fear and precarity, uh, who are being degraded and dehumanized every single day by our policies as we watch. Too many have died violent deaths in Calais and at the borders of Europe and suffered unimaginable trauma because of EU policies. What kind of society do we want to live in and what values do we want to underpin it? This violence has been carried out in our name and we must stand against it. Thanks very much, Alan. That was fantastic.